Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. West Virginia is very excited about uh, hosting the Energy Council and having you come to West Virginia. I hope you found your uh, visit here pleasurable so far, and there are other activities that I encourage you to participate in. At this point in time, I would, it's my pleasure to introduce the 36th governor of the state of West Virginia, Governor Justice, by way of background, attended Greenbrier Military Academy, as well as Marshall University. At Marshall University, he was the captain of the golf team for two years. He obtained an undergraduate degree and a master's in business administration before joining his family business in 1976. Um, he has always had a strong interest in nature and outdoors, and as a result of that, he established in this state and in other states Justice Family Farms uh, here in West Virginia. He has uh, helped to turn those farms into a major agricultural enterprise and, and became the largest farmer east of the Mississippi River. Upon his father's death, he became CEO of Bluestone Industries and Bluestone Coal Corporation. In that capacity, he launched a massive business expansion so that before he was elected governor, he was president and CEO of 102 different companies. Uh, he also purchased and improved this Greenbrier Hotel. And he's very interested in developing tourism opportunities here in West Virginia. In, in 2016, he was elected governor of the state of West Virginia. We are very excited, and I am personally very excited, to welcome him to this Energy Council meeting and be able to induce uh, Governor Jim Justice. Governor Justice. All right, everybody, I'm going to come right over here and sit and talk to you, okay? I'm going to get this out of the way. Now, it's hard to imagine this body being a golfer, isn't it? But at one time, believe it or not, I was skinny and had brown hair. Seems like a long time ago to me. But uh, first and foremost, I welcome you to West Virginia, a lot of you. We've got delegates and we've got maybe senators or whomever may be here. Brother Bill was kind enough to introduce me. And he's been with us for a long time. And he's done an incredible job and I thank him in every way. And, uh, but, let me just say this. For those of you that may be here for your first time, you're going to find a state that is really on its way, really moving. You know, when you, you, could, you could say I'm a lot of things, but you can't say I'm not a business guy. You know, you, you know and I've done lots of stuff, lots and lots and lots of stuff. Create a lot, a lot of companies and started with nothing. Now just think about it. Grandparents that didn't have indoor plumbing. I am the American dream in every way, shape, form, or fashion. We worked and we worked really, really hard and we were blessed beyond belief with the blessings of the good Lord in every way. Now, along that way, you make a lot of mistakes and you learn a lot of stuff. And I can tell you through all that, then all of a sudden, for whatever the reason may be, you decide because you love our state and you love our people, and you really don't want anything for yourself in any way, and I don't, you decide you're gonna run for governor. And you do. And it's a tough job. And you catch all kinds of flack and you catch stuff that, where people tell one part to a hundred part puzzle 
and distort that and call that news. And it's a shame. It's a pathetic sh shame. But in all that, you know as your governor, when they hand you a set of books, that our state is bankrupt. And you gotta do something. And so you get to work with a lot of the great people that are in this room right here. Bill, many of the colleagues. You make a decision that I've made a long, long time ago in life, and that is just this. West Virginia is a natural resource state, and we should be really proud of that. Really proud of that. Now, whether it be coal or oil or gas or whatever it may be, timber, water, we absolutely abound in natural resources beyond belief. Now, just to tell it like it is, because I'm going to get right to the point, and, you know, and I don't, you see, I don't have notes, I don't sit and talk to you and just, a, you know, just a pat deal and then walk out the door. I talk to you from my heart. I pride myself in this. I make mistakes, just like I just said. But I will not, I will not be a politician. I will not ever not tell you the truth to the best of my ability. Now that's all there is to it. And my dad taught me that. Now I can remember just like it was yesterday, standing in front of my dad's desk, and this is a virtue, but it is also a curse, because you won't give up. You know, at the end of the day, I was in front of my dad's desk and my dad said something, and I said, Dad, there wasn't anything I could do. I was probably 18 or 19 years old. He played a little bit of football for Purdue University. He wasn't a star by any stretch of the imagination, but his arms were about as big around at that time as my legs. And I was probably just standing in front of him. Who knows what in the world it was that I said, Dad, there wasn't anything I could do. When all of a sudden the desk exploded and he jumped across the desk and grabbed me by my shirt and threw me down on the desk and said, damn you, there's always something you can do and you better damn well always remember that. <laughs> now, that's my life and that's how I grew up and that's how I think. Now here's the real deal. Energy in this nation as we know it is under attack beyond belief. And it is terrible, terrible in my eyes. Now, from the standpoint of coal or gas, none of us, I think, you know, want to turn our back on all the alternatives that are out there. We want to embrace an all-in strategy. We have said that over and over and over. We all want clean air. We all want the cleanest water. I'm a guy, and you know, and Bill was kind enough to say how much I love the outdoors. I mean, for crying out loud, I do. I mean, I'm a bird hunter. I'm, I've, I'm a trout fisherman. I'm broke up in a lot of different ways now and everything. I stumble around behind a bird dog as best I possibly can. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm bow hunting, uh, which is, to me, you know, an excuse for not being able to walk real good. And, uh, but, but nevertheless, nobody wants any more cleaner water, cleaner air, better environment, and everything than I. But I am absolutely a believer with all my soul that you are the engines. You are the intelligence. You are the very, very soul of what will make this nation go. You always have been. You always have been. Abundant, cheap energy. Absolutely, without any question in the world, civilization will not progress without abundant, cheap energy. Now, if we want to crawl in a hole and just move away from the earth, if we want to do that, and we don't want to progress as a civilization, then frankly, to tell you the honest truth, I believe that every last one of you are put here, and me included, by God above to do something, to do something, to tend to the garden, to work, exactly what Adam and Eve were supposed to do, work. Now, at the end of the day, that's what we do. 
And that's what you've done. And you've been superstars at it. Now, all I would say going forward is just this. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure my daughter, Jill, who's running this place, along with Elmer and everything, really, really appreciate you being at the Greenbrier. You're going to have a beautiful day. I hope you have big fun and lots of smiles. I would end by just telling you that the good Lord above gave you the ability to smile and to laugh. And this journey is doggone tough. And use that, use that ability every day that you possibly can. Smile and laugh as much as you can. And I'm going to leave you with a couple of stories really quick that will make you smile and laugh. And that's just this. The first one is you may think, and I tell this story all the time, but you may think, what's it like, Justice, owning the Greenbrier? Well, let me just tell you. Not long after I bought the Greenbrier, you know, the true stories are the funny stories. Jokes are just jokes. But true stories are the very best of the best. You know, not long after I bought the Green Bar, probably six months, we were trying to get this thing going and we were working at it in every way, shape, form, or fashion. And I was right downstairs buying a paper and I was standing there and right in front of me, and it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, and right in front of me was this beautiful little girl. She was about four years old and a young guy, probably he was maybe 35 or 40 years old, his daughter, and she's just all over the place. And he says to me, and they'd been in the main dining room having breakfast and everything, and he says, you go ahead. He said, who knows what she's going to do and everything. And so I stepped, and I was paying for the paper, and when I did, the beeper on my side went off. And that little girl screamed, watch out, Daddy, he's backing up. <laughs> can't be any better than that. There's no way. And you may think, well, what's it like being the governor? And I tell you just this, this is, this, and you got, and ladies, please forgive me because I try to avoid using any kind of words like this, but listen, I've got to tell you this just as it happened, but there's two stories. First of all, I am, I am, I always drive myself. The state police follow me. To be perfectly honest, I don't really know exactly what I do, but I'm a whole lot more comfortable driving. And those state, state policemen drive crazy, so I just drive myself. And sometimes they lose me, and it makes them real nervous, and, and, but that's okay, too. But I was in Fairmont, and I was going, this is as true as it could be. It happened probably, I don't know, a month ago. But anyway, I'm going through McDonald's, and I pull up to the first window, and I've got three other people in the vehicle with me, and I've got another person, and she's riding in the, in the poli a state police cruiser, and there's two state policemen, and she's in the back seat of it, and they're over here right beside me. And so I'm getting food for everybody and everything, and I'm paying the lady, and it's a big order, and it's food for every, everybody, and so, so it's a big order and everything. And there's two ladies there, and I'm thinking to myself, they don't have any idea who I am. And it's hard to imagine, and from my standpoint, how can you not notice me? I mean, I've got white hair, I'm nine foot tall, and I weigh 700 pounds. <laughs> you got to know who I am. Well, they don't have a clue who I am. So I, I pay them, I pull up to the next window to get the food, and these two girls are standing there, and they're watching the cruiser. And they say to one another, they got somebody, don't they? <laughs> you see that woman in the back seat? and everything, and so they're sitting there and they're just talking like that and everything, and they, they're looking right at me, but they don't have any idea who I am too, and I just so happened I was driving the Denali from the state capitol that day, and it had the, it had the lights and the siren on the whole deal, and, and they said, they looked at me and said, what are they doing here? And I said, well, what about this? And I just clicked the lights on and hit the siren, and that girl right there to the one to screen, holy shit, he's a cop too. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, listen. My last of my last is just this, and then I'm gonna leave you. There's a guy, yeah, his name is J.W. Davis. He, he was really a prominent guy, board of directors of Dr. Pepper National Board. He was just a 
he just, you know, was halfway responsible for bringing Frito Lay maybe to the United States and a lot of stuff. He really Texan, really, really, actually in the oil and gas business, and, and he taught me lots of stuff. But he said, you know, in his life, if he could not make his salespeople, he said, I'd meet with them a lot of times at seven, at six forty-five in the morning, and he said. Then after I met with him, I'd go to bed. But he said, when I was there with him, if I couldn't make him smile and laugh, I didn't leave him. You know, well, it's a great, great story in my book. I got to know him when he was 84 years old, and he's not with us now, but he, he was a great, great man. But let me, let me end with just this. My first day on the job, my very first day, you know, other than the inauguration, all the ceremonies and all that, my first day that evening, I had to coach a basketball game over at Princeton, you know, which is not far from here, because I'm coaching the girls' high school basketball team. At our public, it's the highest public level you can coach at. And I've done that forever and everything, and I love kids, and I don't go on vacations. I don't do stuff. I mean, I, I don't go places. I just work. And it really helps me, you know, because I love the kids, and I love being with them, and, and that's all there is to it. But anyway, so I'm over there. And I, we win the game, thank goodness, we come out of the gym, and my wife is with me and a great friend. Well, I always drive. I said, Mo, you're going to have to drive because I'm worn out from all this inauguration stuff and everything. And so Mo gets in to drive. The state policeman, one of the state policemen walks up. He's a young kid and everything, the uniform on and everything. He says, uh, you know, he says, Governor, I'm going to be writing your taillights all the way to your house. Well, this is a new thing for me you know, and everything. And so I said, okay, that's great and everything. So I get in the Suburban and off we go. And we get to the first toll booth. You may think this is anything but the truth, but it's gospel. We get to the first toll booth and everything. And all of a sudden he goes, shoo, right by me and shoo, right through the toll booth he goes. I said, follow him, Mo. And Mo goes, shoo, right through the toll booth too. And I thought, boy, this is pretty daggum good until I got an $89 ticket for that one. <laughs> True as it can be. And then we just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And I said, well, we're going to get home really, really fast and everything. And then it dawned on me that Mo's vehicle was on past the exit where we would turn going toward my house. We had to go on straight. So I said, well, what am I going to do and everything? And Kathy said, well, call the captain of the detail and tell him. And I did. And Drew Pendleton said, Captain Pendleton said, I'll take care of it, Governor. And, and so we hung up. And in two minutes, he called right back. He said, Governor, now we're doing 92 miles an hour when he called back. He says, Governor, the trooper in front of you is not with you. <laughs> he said, he is transporting a prisoner to jail. And the trooper behind you says he can't keep up with your ass. Now, those are true stories. Y'all have a great day. God bless you for all you do. Thank you so much.